It's good to go in prayer as we consider the will of God and uh, we got this Bible study and next week Bible study. Uh, we're going to expand that. And you say, have we finished next week on the spiritual man? No, not yet. So continue till next year. Uh, no. But at least we will finish the part about the will. And so let's go to God in prayer. Father, we ask that you continue to express your will into our lives. There's nothing else we want to do except the will of God. We ask, O oh Father, that we may have an understanding of what Jesus wants to do in our lives all the time, and that we will do your will, Father, and we establish your will in our life. We praise you, we thank you, Father, for your goodness and your mercy. Let your will be done always, in our individual lives, corporately. Let the beauty of holiness surround us, Father. And Father, Cause us to be so changed on the inside that we delight after your will. We desire after your will. Thank you, Father God, for your grace, your mercy established upon our lives. We give you thanks. We ask that the spirit of wisdom and revelation will come upon our hearts and our minds that will renew us and change us so that when we walk out of this place, we walk with a new level of understanding and transformation. Transform us as we see Jesus in all His glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Amen. Well, let's look at the chart first, then uh, we don't have to look at it again. This is the old chart, and uh, so we go straight to the new chart. Thank you. About the wheel, uh, this is the new chart. Uh, we'll be concentrating on the will, the, the will of the soul. Uh, we have realized that uh, the will of the soul requires the work of the emotion and also the mind. And we have said that the emotion plays a lot in the will being strengthened. Uh, and uh, in the mind, uh, if the mind is in it, the thing is quite complete as a circle. We need to also look at the spirit will and then the body will, the relationship between these three. We'll look at the relationship this way in a circle. Today we're going to look at the relationship this way and uh, a crossover between that. And so knowing what the chart is, let's go straight to the uh, Bible. And the uh, first familiar verse that we're going to look at is the uh, Gospel of Matthew. Let's look at Matthew. Matthew, yes, and um, Lord's Prayer, which is uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, it is part of our Christian experience to learn that God wants His will to be done all the time. The foremost and most important thing. In fact, uh, life is about doing God's will. Life is not about earning food, clothing, and shelter. When it says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek, f seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, He's telling you actually to seek His will. And then to perform His will by His way. And then He take care of food, clothing, and shelter. But we have never been taught that in our Christian life. Because most of the time we came from a non-Christian life. And in non-Christian life, it's a survival of the fittest. Uh, not true in a Bible sense, uh, but that's what everybody is doing. They're trying to survive in life. They're trying to make a living, trying to get food on the table, uh, shelter over their heads, clothing to keep warm. Uh, food, clothing and shelter is a struggle of this life. Which Jesus said that the Gentiles do that all the time. This is what the Gentiles is doing. He never condemned it. He didn't say that it was wrong. But he says that is a lower level of living. The higher level of living is to do God's will. And that gets taken care. It is almost like saying, become God's employee. And you perform and do only the goals and the objectives of God's company. And when you are serving God, God pays well. 
God pays well, sometimes too well for a lot of people, a lot of preachers, and then they misuse the prosperity. But God pays well when you serve Him. God will bring to you all that you ever need, food, clothing, and shelter. But long, long ago, you know these times have changed. Long, long ago, it was about 20 or 30 years ago, and you say God called you to the ministry. Uh, most of the time, your family members will say, what? Got enough to eat. How are you going to survive? What are you going to do? Uh, and uh, it's like the ministry is a place where you don't get money and uh, don't get much. Uh, and that's it. But today's mentality has changed. I guess because of so much prosperity teaching, uh, people view the ministry wrongly. Uh, and uh, many people go into the ministry hoping to build their ministries, mega ministries and mega churches. Then they have tons and tons of finances wrong motivation and of course in many traditional churches they become very very rich out of the blessing of God but in the richness of the church the church forgets a lot just like Israel forgets a lot in the prosperity and then serving the Lord becomes just a full-time job of uh, churchianity or church work without any any compunction to think about what the Father's will is. We're no more thinking about it. We're just like sucked into the organization. But originally, all the Father wanted was His kingdom to come, His will be done. As the Lord's Prayer says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And if we were focused always to seek God's will every day, I didn't say that you discover it immediately. But if every day you seek God's will, at some point in your seeking, you will start entering God's will. That which you seek after will come into you. And the specific, there's a general will, then the specific will of God for your life. Now, is this the pattern of Jesus? Yes, it is. Let's look at Jesus' life. And... Um, in Jesus' life, okay. Oh, no, the single finger one is not happening. Let's get here. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. It speaks of Jesus coming to the earth. And it says, Sacrifice and offering, Hebrews 10 verse 5 onwards. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Jesus' main coming to this earth was to do the will of God. And of course, the Greek word will is telema, which we look at. Uh, telema, which more links... Uh, into the area of the emotions we have mentioned. Or telema has also been translated as the word desire inside which one of us? The will of God, the desire of God. Then uh, Jesus in practice uh, actually did that too. And you look over at the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John, these are Jesus' own words. Well, John has a lot, 107 more verses. Um, that, but we're going to just look at John, especially in uh, chapter 5 on looking over here. In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 30. This is Jesus' statement. Now that Jesus has grown up, before He came, He came to do the will. Now that Jesus has grown up, He makes His statement in verse 30 of John, chapter 5, in His ministry. I can on myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. It's obvious that the will of God is very, very important to Him. Now, the past two weeks, we have been touching on the will of the soul, the will of the soul. But in a sense, it's not the will of the soul that we want to do. We are talking about the ability of the soul. But the soul by itself cannot discover God's will. 
The soul needs to discover God's will from the Spirit. It's the Spirit that drops the will of God into the soul. Uh, now, when we look at the word uh, telema, which is uh, the word for uh, will, we have mentioned how that uh, besides being translated as will, it has also been linked to the word uh, desire or aspirations and uh, uh, different, different things. Like, for example, we have done that before two weeks ago. So I'll just read a refresher for you. Say in uh, like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, talks about the desires of the flesh. When you look at the word desire, it's telema. And uh, the word desire is another translation for the word will. Now let's look at only the translation of desire because there are two Greek words for desire, not all of it unnecessarily um, from the word telema. But let's look at some of them. I desire mercy, telo, which is also fine. Telo and telema are two different variations of uh, the word will. Uh, so they are more like a third person, second person kind of derivation. And so here, in uh, Matthew chapter 9 verse 13, which I put in front of you, I desire so the word will or tello, desire here is the word tello, uh, from the root word telema, it is just the will or the desire of God. Now let's see whether that's applicable. The Lord's Prayer, Father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy desire be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not bad. Still the translation can carry. And Jesus could say, you know, I've come in a volume of the book to do the desire of God, which is still fine. So will and desire are interchangeable in the Greek, in the original. Telema has been translated as desire, and desire has been translated as will. It's like the two are interchangeable. That's a very important concept for us. Because when you say, how do we know when the Spirit will? The will of the Spirit. What does it feel like? It is a desire. A desire. So there's a desire on your inside. Except that this desire is... You can see that, okay, the will of God is like the desire of God. And uh, so... What happens is, God's desires get imparted into your spirit and they inspire a desire to do God's will. It's interesting that the word will in the English language has yeah, many words for the word will. Volition, choice, but we have never used the word desire for will. We treat desire as something else. But the Bible treats desire as equal to will. That is something that we need to renew our mind to. And then when we see desire the next time, then we know that that's how God speaks His will. See, many of you pray, Father, what is your will? Teach me your will. Right? He says, show me your will. What do you want your will? What do you want me to do in my life? What shall I do this year? What shall I do this month? What shall I do today? Always. And you're trying to get the will of God by your mind. Correct? For you to do God's will is to know God's will. Uh, now. So, let me ask this question. Have any interaction? How do you know God's will in your normal life? Your normal life. How do you know something is God's will? Let's see some answers. Smart Alex is very busy, eh? Okay, so Mrs. Smart Alex starts first. Busy. Generally, 
Yes. Based on Bible. Based on Bible. What Bible is okay. 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 So General. very good that she say that. So we eliminate one area. The will of God is what the Bible says. So whatever the Bible wants you to do. But the Bible does not tell you which job to go to. The Bible does not tell you which business to go to. Bible does not tell you whether you go to Bible college or go to university. Bible does not tell you which job to go for. Bible doesn't tell you all those things. It only tells you uh, glorify Jesus, seek Jesus, love Jesus with first love, and uh, evangelize, preach the gospel wherever you can, be a good witness, everything. But come to the practical things of your life. Surely God's will is more than that. So we thank you very much. We zoom, eliminate the part about the Bible. How about the more specific part? Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. So what is that? That's the will of God or your will? So okay. Proverbs emphasize a lot of things on lifestyle. Okay. But however, specifically on God's will, <laughs> she has not really answered the question. <laughs> she says a lot of statements, but the answer never came up. Okay. Okay, continue. How do you know God's will? Inner knowing. Inner knowing, a good point, yes. Uh, okay, from, uh, Psalms 37, verse 4. Yes. Uh, you like yourself also in the Lord. In the path of the Lord, He will guide you. quote Psalms 37 about delighting in the Lord and He give you these desires of your heart. There are also many verses in the Psalm that say, I delight to do your will, O God. Uh, and uh, so the devil delight, desires and all that uh, come together uh, and uh, the Lord will give you give the desire. That sounds like Matthew chapter 6 in a different manner. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things added to you. Delight yourself in the Lord and you will have your desires of your heart. And so, uh, it's stating something from the Bible. But how about more personalized that? How do you know the will of God in your life? How is God's will? So that one answer was inner knowing. And we're asking the question, Alex, uh, how do you know God's will? So, keep thinking, you just arrived. Sam? A place in your heart, a place of assurance, peace in your heart. Okay. Yeah. While they are talking, can we give the big chart, the new chart? Yes. I'm going to show how everyone, this section that they are in. And um, Colin was talking about uh, delight yourself in the Lord. So there will be emotion here. He will give you the desires of your heart. So, just say it's in this area. You are saying? Peace. Peace. So, we assume spirit emotion. So, when you are in this peace, then you will, you will know God's will. Then there was just now an answer, inner knowing. Inner knowing isn't it spirit mind? Correct. Can I say inner knowing is spirit mind? Okay, I classify your spirit mind. One God here. So, peace. Okay, emotion here. Uh, any other answer? And uh, how do you know God's will? Meditation. 
Meditation? Yeah, the meditation is towards seeking. Ah, uh, meditation? So seeking, seeking. Seeking. Yeah. Seeking, seeking God's will. Meditate. Meditate on the word. So that is the process of knowing God's will. But how do you know it's God's will? Hearing His voice is one thing. Hearing His voice, okay. Hearing His voice, okay, that is another methodology. Hearing His voice. If He speaks, that means, can I say that if He speaks, there is some impartation of knowledge? Knowing? Right? God speaks where to go, what to do. Like He told Ananias in the book of Acts chapter 9. He told him where to go to meet Saul to pray for him. And right? so, God speaks. You know what to do. You know what to do. And then, here. Yeah. Can I classify voice as mind also? I will classify it under the mind, spiritual mind. Okay? The mind hears the knowledge. And because the spiritual mind will impart to the soul. You hear the spirit, then the soul knows what to do. Knowledge comes. Right. Any others? Yes, Colin? Okay, so there is um, uh, First John and it says if our heart doesn't, First John chapter 3, if our heart doesn't condemn us, then uh, we're confident towards God. That is about prayer. And the heart, of course, we know is all of the, all the spirit, all the soul. And we treat that, that, that's still very general. We need a bit more specific. Uh, before, yes? Before we seek for God's will, right? Do you need to pray and fast first? Before we seek for God's will, we pray and fast. Item. Yes. But fasting and prayer is a methodology. In itself, it is a will of God for us to always to pray. Always a fast. In other words, the methodology is sanctified. But there are a lot of people who are also fasting. Mahatma Gandhi also fasted. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there are a few cut leaders also fasted. So the methodology itself need not lead to God's will. However, but during the prayer time, right, fasting time, God will reveal Himself through your prayer, to your work, to confirmation for other godly people, to dreams and visions. All these, yes. of course, all these things. So you're, time, you're bringing out that the methodology of fasting and prayer can make us more open to hear God. And God can reveal in dreams and visions. Dreams and visions, can I put here, it, it gives you knowledge here. Right? Dreams and vision. So, fasting is a methodology. Which is why fasting and prayer uh, is, uh, is what I call a sanctioned method to enter the spiritual realm. Even non-Christians tap on it. When uh, non-Christians want to be possessed by demons, sometimes they also have to fast. So the difference is, is not the methodology. The difference is the source. The source. And uh, so it's good to fast. Doesn't mean that after you hear this tonight, say, well, no need to fast anymore. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. No. No. Don't excuse yourself. Jesus fasted. Moses fasted. And Jesus said his church will fast. So fasting is a good method. But again, I can see that you talk about fasting receives revelation from God and you're still in the spirit mind. Uh, let me give one more. In the middle section here, anyone? And then we give you a last one, Alex. Yes. How do you classify impression? Impressions. Inner knowing impression. Impression can be either emotion or, or mind. Okay, very good. Uh, any others in the middle before we go to Alex giving the finale answer? <laughs> Started with Mrs. Alex and with Mr. Elex. <laughs> Mm. Let's pull your chin a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Has the resolve to do it. Okay. Has the resolve, the resolve and determination of it. Okay. Remember, you're answering the question, how do you know God's will?
Okay, you as, do exactly what Mrs. Alex did. She said nothing by the words. <laughs> <laughs> so, it'll be desirable. Okay, can so you, uh, you say a sentence, but the sentence means the same thing that he was saying. Can we be guided by the, uh, the fruit of the spirit, but there is an element of love, joy, peace. In love, joy, peace, that supports Sam's one, love, joy, peace here. Correct. Now, can you see? Can you see very clearly I've shown you? Most of your answers keep giving the will, the what is the will of God by talking about the mind and the emotion. Can you see that? You keep making okay, visions and dreams. My inner knowing, my peace, uh, emotion. You've been giving. You have actually kept talking about the spirit emotion and the spirit mind. Inner hey? Inner Pardon? Inner, inner prompting can be emotion or mind, the sense. Can you see that when I ask the question, how do you know God's will? But the, he said desire, ma, the spirit people. Uh, yeah. So uh, he says desire, but he goes to other things. <laughs> Yeah. Design, what okay. Correct. Ah, so he didn't mention desire, but he was not very clear. <laughs> okay, would you like to say your sentence again? Okay, desire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you just change his answer. <laughs> okay, just change his answer. Now, you can see that we don't understand what the will is. The will in the Greek is a telema, a telo, and it's translated, especially telo, as desire. So when we seek after God's will, we have always been seeking the mind rather than the will. And here's the problem, you know, why we cannot know. Because the mind is a secondary level. There is a dual level when you relate to God the Father. The first level is just the desire here. Then the second level reaches the mind or the emotions. I will explain. Remember, he says that we are here to do the Father's will. And the first thing he talked about it is he says that we are his servants. A servant does the will of the Master. So, what the Master says, like he, like he says, when the voice of God comes, then we obey. And so, there is a level where we do the will of God as a servant. There is a level where we do the will of God as a friend. These are the two levels I want to point to. They are actually in your Bible. And uh, so, let's look here at, um, we have a look at the word desire. And so we don't have to, we got, we got lots of verses to support that the word desire is a word tallow. And uh, that is there. But um, let's look at some examples. Let's go back to the word wheel. I'll highlight the word wheel for you. And uh, right in Matthew, there's a little parable. In Matthew, there's a little parable. Let me get it out here. And um, Jesus speaks a little parable. So much on the world will. And, uh, okay, we're still in a. We're going to get past out of uh, some of the mound. Okay, let's uh, go 
got it here. Send it for results. Okay, let's get this on first here. Just jump straight to the west. Okay. Okay. In uh, Matthew 7, 21, first, it says, Not everyone who say to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. I wonder how many Christians call Jesus Lord, but on earth, in their early life, they never do God's will. Of course, I don't think they are in this category of those who are not saved. Here, the category of those who are not saved is they actually practice lawlessness. As you see in verse 23, they did something opposite from God's will. So these people are not saved. So perhaps for many Christians who scrap their way into heaven, they at least didn't do bad, but didn't do God's will. They're just there hanging on to Jesus to salvation. Not good enough. They might be the category I call that. See, the first category all lost. They do the opposite from God's will. They went against God's will. To go against God's will is frightening. Even someone who knows the Lord and goes against God's will, you can go to a certain extent and then you sin against the Holy Spirit and then go further and further, you might lose your salvation. Like Judas is carried. He went directly against. God's will. Or oh, there's a sin against the Holy Spirit. So then there are those who don't do God's will, but they don't really go against God's will. They're floating somewhere. I call this middle group, they are safe, but they are naked. Zero reward in heaven. The Bible has such a thing. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and chapter 3. It says, you're safe, but you're naked. You got no reward. Can you imagine you got no reward in heaven? There are a lot of Christians who have no rewards. And one of the extreme part about the hyper grace message is this. Everything Jesus did for you, sit down, do nothing. That teaching will produce a whole group of Christians who are saved but who don't pray because they don't believe pray. After Jesus finished all the prayer. Grace, right? So grace, no need to pray. Uh, and then, no need to read the Bible, no need to do much, no need to do everything. Just, He did it for me. That's it. Consider it that. That kind of Christianity will produce zero reward in heaven. They might get away on earth but it's a dangerous Christianity that is robbing people of their reward. Because they got no more zeal for all night prayer. No more zeal for fasting. No more zeal for anything. Because hyper grace takes away your zeal. I've been told by some people who I met earlier in hyper grace. And they say, well, we love him because he had done all the things. Okay, show me your love. Do you love him enough that you fast and pray? No, I don't need to fast and pray. See? Do you love Him enough to give all your life to Him? No need. He did it for me. I don't need to do it again. And hyper grace go to extend of no need to confess sin. Because First John 1, 9 doesn't operate for that. And then on Friday night, I'll talk tomorrow about, uh, because uh, Pastor Joshua sent me a whole lot of stuff and I was talking about sin nature. Hyper grace people don't believe in sin nature anymore. They don't even believe it exists. In Christ, it's all disappeared. For us, it exists, it's a battle, and you need to learn how to overcome. There is a way to live without sin nature. 
So hypergrace got part of the message, but they got the methodology wrong. It, hypergrace is actually half the gospel. When you preach half of something, it equals half. Half plus zero still equals half. You need another half to complete it. So hypergrace people forget 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10. It says, I labor more abundantly because of the grace that is working in me. See, hypergrace message people miss two things about grace. Firstly, grace is a position. But they miss the other half. Grace is a substance. It's a substance that comes into you and make you labor more abundantly than you could ever. Hypergrace only teach the position in Christ. They don't teach you that there's something of the substance of grace that enters into you and changes you on the inside and make you want to pray, make you want to fast, make you want to serve God. So there's no teaching that grace is a substance. They miss, they teach only half the message. <laughs> And you can easily prove that grace is a substance. First Corinthians 15 verse 10. What is that inside Paul? It's like grace is an active persona inside him, pushing him. And that's what the grace message lacks. Right. So the result, the Christian life are not very effective. Many of them don't know how to pray, 14, uh, pray and fast 14 days. They don't even know how to uh, read and study the Bible. Because the grace did not lead them towards God. It lead them into the world and have an easy life in the world. No need to do anything. After all, it's salvation and that's all they're interested in. So, anyway, that's uh, just a side point that, and uh, which I'll mention tomorrow when we talk about sin nature uh, in the evening. And uh, Jesus, uh, well, there's a lot on the will of God here. And uh, let me get the parable out. Okay, just a short little one in the Gospel of Matthew. And get it out for you. Okay, touch. Got it. See the results. Touch. more specific search. Matthew. Oops. My touch screen doesn't move. Okay. There you go. Matthew chapter 21, 28. Two sons stories. What do you think? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, Go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? Remember, the will of the father. They said the first. So notice, it's not what you say. The first said he won't do it, but he actually did it. The second said, I will do it, but he didn't do it. Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is based on actually doing. The part about, about the will is the doing part. Getting it from the desire part to the doing part. And just now I analyze how do you know it's God's will. The most important thing is the inspiration of the desire. The desire is the will. So how do you know whether it's God's will for you to go to uh, this university versus the other university? How will God speak to you? He will put a desire in. He will put a desire to you. Now I know your next question. How do I know that desire is not for myself? <laughs> yes, I know your thoughts are really going that direction. But let me finish first. 
Everything comes from desire. If God wants, um, if God wants, the first stage is actually desire, without understanding. Like if God wants a pastor or Bible school student to be a missionary to Africa, the first thing God does is put a desire there. A desire to go to Africa. Now he might not know why he wants to go there, what he wants to do, but he will put a desire. If God wants you to, for example, uh, move from one country to another, let's say migrate, He will put a desire into you for that place. Like, before the tsunami, many people are going to migrate. There are so many places. The China, in, inland, uh, there will be um, Canada, Brazil, uh, Australia, so many places to go. Where does God want you to go? He will put a desire. See, this is what we don't realize. The will is the desire. The desire is the will. But let's not go to the second part about your desires versus God's desire. That's a secondary matter. But let's remember, without the desire first, nothing happens. The desire must come. God will put the desire. God has never called anyone without putting a desire. How do I know God called me to the ministry? He put a desire for the ministry. Now, other things come up. He might not tell you what you're supposed to do, what your calling is. Those comes later. But He put a desire. The desire must come. So, in answer to the question I asked, how do I know if something is God's will for me? How do I know God's will for me? Your first answer should have been, God put His desire in me. Very simple answer. Based on the Bible fact that I already show you, the will is the desire. Desire is the will. It is like the two are one. The two equal each other. And based on the Greek word, the word desire is telo, and telema, the word will is telo and telema. They are more equal. And we test out certain verses to see if we replace the word will with desire, whether it will sound okay, it will still okay. Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, your desire be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's still alright. Perfect. And so the first thing God does is He puts his desire into us. If you cannot feel His desire in you, it is not His will. The secondary problem of filtering out your own desires from God's desire, that's a secondary problem. At least you must have God's desire on your inside. Are we very clear there? The desire must be there. Without the desire, you will not discover God's will. Thank you, yes? Before the desire, you had a seeking there. Before the desire, you had a seeking. Now, it could be the desire that drove the seeking. Because you did say before, God will show you the thing that you are looking for. Yes. Ask and you shall receive. I mean Seek and you shall find, not and shall it be open to you. Yeah, I mean the revelation part. Because if you have the desire to know beyond, then God will. Correct. That's talking about revelation. God only reveal according to your desire. And that desire, here's the most powerful thing. We don't realize God actually put desires. We only think God put thoughts and understanding. But desire is a different category from emotions. Peace, love, joy. Because you might desire and then you don't have peace yet. You might have desire and don't have the feeling of love. You might have desire and you got no understanding yet. Can you see it's a separate thing on its own? But the desire can be a different degree that we recognize. Like for example, uh, Colin might have a desire to visit the United States. The question is, 
is that desire from God. See, that's how you discover God's will. Oh, I look around and say that Jedutel has a desire to uh, go further and develop uh, both in worship at the same time with a ministry arm and in the business thing that is some idea. The thing is, is that God's will? See, what we have never wrestled with is we have never classified our desires. When it's staring us in the face, desire is an important area to start when you want to discover God's will. It is totally separate from your inner emotion. It's just that the thing that that strikes you, that wanting to, that desire, it is the Lord working in you. So how do you know whether God's will is in something? God will have drawn His desire. Now your own will might work in different ways. But there is that desire to do something. I did not say that you will like the desire. It depends on your soul. That's uh, what we're coming to. Any other questions on God putting desire in us before we go to that secondary point? Yes, colleague. Uh, Pastor just mentioned that we may not like the desire. Yes. Yes. How does it feel like that? Uh, how does it feel like when you got desire but you don't like the desire? <laughs> 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 oh, I mean, uh, the other thing I, I recall that the, it's God's will for us to study the word and love His word, but there's so many Christians who don't like to study His word. So what's happening in there? Yes. So, Yet there's a desire to study the word. Yes. Ah, they know that it's good. Uh, but there is a desire. Yeah, so there is a desire in their, in their, let's say the spirit will, soul will, and the body will, correct? They represent three desires. You got a conflict of three desires. If, I re if the word will can be replaced by the word desire, I could easily have said spirit desire, soul desire, and body desire. Correct. Technically, I think correct. Which means, you got three desires. If they are in conflict. See, every Christian has a desire to know God. But it might, eat, might be eaten up. The question is, which one affects which one and which one is reacting? When you are born again, the spirit always starts first, the desire. Your soul and your body has its own all the time. And if you time it by the millisecond, the desire from the spirit comes first. Then the next millisecond, your soul reacts. and say, hey, I don't like that. Then your body makes a decision also. But it's reacting to something that got put inside. Like God throws something inside. Like you all would know if somebody do cooking and they put a lot of garlic. You can smell it. Right? Thank you for those peanuts that your sister cooked. Lots of garlic. Yeah. You can tell. Lots of garlic. Not bad. After eating it, I need to brush my teeth. <laughs> so, you could tell. Because when you drop garlic in, it just overpowers the thing. And there's a garlic taste and, and sense. It's just like your Singapore fried bread here. The best of the best of the best must always have pork, pork fat. Correct? Put life. It must have. It was, it was what gave, and if they came, they were 
fry in pork fat because it gives the pork fragrance, which to the Chinese smells nice. <laughs> and not only that, you know the best, the best fried kway teow, fried fasting. Eh? Okay. The fried kway teow must use duck egg because chicken egg has a different flavor from duck egg. Duck egg has the little what I call a slightly more fragrant flavor than the chicken egg. So if you fry it with duck egg. It has its own slightly. <laughs> and people might say, an egg is an egg and it's an egg. But when you taste it, a fried quaker with duck egg and taste a fried quaker with chicken egg, then you will know the difference. Which, by the way, you need to wipe all the saliva right now. <laughs> but, how do we coordinate those desires? God throws his desire into us. Philippians chapter 2, a verse that you all know very well. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, and um, I read just now the words that in the end is the doing part, then it succeeds. Without the doing part, you might even say it, but you never do it, it's still not done. The will is not considered done. So in Philippians, I now. Okay. Uh, chapter 3. I Philippians here. Let's see here. Yes, I am. Chapter 3. Mm. Oh, I got it. Okay. First, uh, yeah, these are so big. Go the distance. Okay. Paul says here. Yeah. Press on, press on. It's so big. I gotta use the other stuff. Chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. I need to make it a bit smaller. Okay. Still alright for you? Yeah, I make it too big today. Yeah. Verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation, fear and trembling. For it is God who works, which is the word anagas, from the word anagio, so you can say it's energizing in you. Both two things to tell that is to will and to do for his good pleasure. So God does two things. He is the word work is the word energy. So he put energy into you so that you have a desire. And then the word do is actually energio also, which is the action flows out. So the energy starts from your inside. You see, this is what the Greek is like. Uh, let me read it in the Greek for you. For it is God who energizes in you both to desire and to energize for his good pleasure. 
So the desire enters into you and then it finishes its work by the energy flowing out through you in action. But it's the same energy. Only when it is inspired by God is the whole energy from Him. There's a big difference here. If God never initiates, it is called works, which He doesn't want. But if God energizes it, it is the fruit of His energy in you. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. It must be born of the spirit. So the desire must come from God. That is that. Desire must come from God. But that desire needs to grow until it can do the action part. And that's where we go back to our old test case of Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7. And we get this where there is a desire on the inside, but it's not coming out properly. Let's read from uh, Romans 7 again. I think I put it a little bit more smaller for my sake. Still okay for you, okay? It looks too big. Right. Now, Paul says here, about the law and um, let's start it. yes he says here for what I'm willing in verse 15 what I am doing I do not understand what I will to do so the word will desire to do what I desire to do I do not practice but what I hate I do now, the desire to do obviously came from God. It was to obey the law and to follow God's word. So that desire, the soul caught on. But the emotions are not winning. We hear from the last two teachings, you must get your emotions with you. You must get your mind with you. So let's say your soul will has received from the spirit will a desire. But based on Philippians chapter 2, the energy that God put must become energy flowing out from you. The word do is the word energy out. It must energy in, energy out. So how to make sure it flows out properly all the way? That's the solution we need tonight. Because your soul has got it. The desire has started. What we have faced... A problem is the desire needs to consume you. How to get the desire to consume our soul, consume all of our being. That's an important part for us. The question is how? In Romans 7, he also identified a problem. The problem was what he says he hates. That means he still likes to do the, the, the a part of him wants to do the other thing, which is inner being hate. And the problem he said was the body. The body was not flowing along. He says here very clearly, in me, in verse 18, in my flesh, nothing good. Then he says, For the good that I desire or will to do, I do not do. The evil I will not do, I end up doing. Now, he says here, yeah, practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I will do, but sin who dwells in me. So you have a problem. The soul is in the middle. The emotions we no need to win. The mind we no need to win. So the soul, here's a soul, the soul receives. But there is the flesh. 
So you got God's desire flowing in you. How do you win the emotion? How do you win the mind? Because last week we conclude, conclude you need the emotion and the mind. Remember there are four states. Remember the four states, four phases. Stage one, desire or the will. Stage two, the mind. Stage the, the, the will and the mind. Stage three, the will and the emotion. Stage four, the will and the emotion and the mind. Remember that? Now, if you remember from last week, how do we win both of them? Did we say anything about how? Did we actually touch on the how? We talked about we should, we must, we have to. We must reach to phase four, state four. Did we talk about the how last week? We didn't. You were around, were you? We didn't say the how. We never say how. Okay, since I didn't say how, I like you to tell me how. <laughs> uh, let me hear how. You all know from last week. We know that the trickle of the desire starts. It's only state one. You have to bring to state four. How to bring to state four? We need to get to state four. Yes. Tell me how. Meditate on God's word. Very good answer. Any other answer? Fast Any? And Fast and pray. Thank you. Worship. I guess you're going to throw me all the standard one. <laughs> I knew she was coming in. <laughs> you know? And uh, all the other things I mean. But all these things we are really doing. Correct? If you are healthy, normal Christian, you'll be doing all those things. There is one important key. The key is from today's study about the word desire. Desire can be increased. If you see the reward, yes, he's getting near. You see the reward. Desire is linked to the eyes. Spiritual eyes or natural eyes? The natural eye is related to the spiritual eye. All desire flows through the eye gate. I know that I read some people are born blind, but the inner eyes. All desires are linked to the word eyes. And that part you must know. Because if you don't know, you don't know how to increase. Let's show from the Bible. Genesis chapter 2. The book of Genesis chapter 2 in the temptation. Satan knew that's the way, whether good or bad, it can be good or bad, how to get uh, E in the wrong area or oh, it's chapter 3 first he comes to Eve and said the serpent has God in it said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden and the woman knew the intellectual argument said we may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden God has said you shall not eat it nor shall you touch it lest you die the touch might have been added to by her, but she knew the intellectual argument. Firstly, the serpent contradict her. Contradict God. You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Up to verse 5, 
I believe Eve was doing very well. Eve was doing very, very well. Okay, what's fine. She started not doing well when somehow she kept looking at the fruit. It's almost like hypnotic. Why does hypnotism go through your eyes? Because the eye gaze is very important. Links to desires. It's worth six that she starts failing. When the woman saw the tree, it was pleasant to the eyes. A tree desirable. By the way, I heard from uh, uh, Eddie that on the 27th of December, you all might have a turkey here. I'm <laughs> saying he doesn't know that. So, yeah, we're going to have turkey in, in, in Sydney. And by the way, on the 20th and 27th, I will broadcast and we're preaching. But on the 27th, uh, after preaching to you, we're going to enjoy our turkey, a home cooked turkey, and our our home cooked, but today got a food, uh, <laughs> and, and our home cooked lamb biryani rice. Oh, wow. Okay, uh, so on the 27th, I broke out, I might show you what it looks like. <laughs> and hopefully, at the end of it, you all have yours. I think um, uh, Louis is going to try to bring a turkey back from Australia. I'm not sure you're going to succeed, but um, uh, turkey. Uh, <laughs> hey, when are you flying back, by the way, after the prayer walk? 23rd. 23rd. Morning flight, evening flight. Afternoon flight. Oh, that means you're going to be in the fellowship on the 22nd. Yes. Okay. I will donate the turkey for you to bring back. Wow. <laughs> okay. If you cook it, I give you a raw one. Hey, how I'm going to keep it in my freezer. We figure out a way. Okay, I'll donate the turkey for you all. Okay. Check the luggage. Okay, then carry it. No, no, can, can. Bro, can I bring it? Just throw the luggage and carry it in. It, it, Australia allows you to pick it up. A uh, apple tree from Malaysia. Not from Australia. I think some of you have carried chunks of lamb back. You have carried chicken from Australia. Uh, from Australia. Yeah, I think Australia is one of the two. Okay. So, um, anyway, I'll give you a turkey. Make sure somebody roasts it. Okay. But my turkey might be like that small. <laughs> I'll give you a good one. Okay. Because turkeys are quite not that expensive. They're quite reasonable price up there. Yeah, I know they were expensive. Just roast it properly. Don't buy it. Yeah, don't not too big, ah. Uh. Oh, your oven is not big enough. Okay, limited by the oven. Okay, okay. So twenty-seven, turkey, and then you add all your other foods that you want. Okay, then you can talk about your fried kway teow. You duck egg. So far, I've not found a fried kway teow man that cook with duck egg. Anybody here? See, you're still not getting the best. <laughs> I'm, uh, no, no, no. Fresh duck egg. Uh, if you ever, if you ever, if, if in a blind test, I give you duck egg and a chicken egg, and don't tell you the sauce, you will notice the flavor of duck egg. It has a, a, a slight uh, smell that adds to the flavor. And that is why in your Chinese uh, salted egg, they only use duck egg. You know why? The extra fragrance. Have anyone ever eaten salted chicken egg? You know why they don't do it? Doesn't smell as good. It's a smell that gives you the taste. And by the way, scientific tests, I already read in biology and all those things, they, when they test, the, when they hold the mouth, uh, the, the, the thing, all your taste came from the smell. If you cannot smell it, your taste actually cannot differentiate much. It depends a lot on the smell. Ha! More knowledge for you all. Now let's get back to the serpent. 
I imagine something is in front of your eye. Whether you like it or not, it produces a desire. Let me take from secular research, as you know that I do a lot of science research and all that. They have tested it on people. Uh, for example, they have tested it on people who are single, when they gather together. And uh, who like who most, and, uh, of course your background does count of course. But when they expose a group of people to images, uh, to, they look at different photos, and then they, they look at it, and then after that they meet the person. But for some people, uh, and then uh, they, they see some, they, they don't say real, they see some photos, but not other photos. Right. And then they see other images. So they found that if they could show a photo for 10 milliseconds, 10 milliseconds is uh, a ten hundredth of a second, uh, 100 seconds times 10 milliseconds. So when they show for 10 milliseconds, which is not too fast for your eye to see the image, but your subconscious mind get it. So when they tested it on random people, they found that when they br bring it in a social situation, the person tend to recognize a person. Something inside them recognize, and because of familiarity, they feel more comfortable with the person. And because they feel more comfortable, they feel the person is more friendly. The power of images. 10 milliseconds is not enough for you to see the picture. But it was enough to influence your subconscious mind. They've done it in many experiments. And uh, when they got two different labels, let's say, and then they want to make you choose the one, think about free choice. They want to make you choose the one. They flash it for 10 milliseconds in images, and you, you, and you look like you haven't seen the two bottles before. But you saw A as versus B, you never saw. Subconsciously, your mind already decided to choose A. Think about free choice. Remember the magicians and all that that seem to know what you choose before you choose? They use hypnotic signs. Like they might say, you know, uh, uh, on the 9th of September, uh, uh, these certain things happen. And uh, no, have you noticed the nine people over there? And then at the end of it, subconsciously, when you're given a number 1 to 10, you choose 9. Because they repeat it so often that they hypnotize you. So some say that the, the, the serpent was almost hypnotizing. Oh, look. You see, you might say you uh, you know you're not very hungry now. <laughs> but if the food is right in front of you, steaming hot. <laughs> with a smell waving to you. Mm -hmm. It is different! Mm -hmm. Because the image causes a desire. Besides that, I have done a study on the word I. And uh, let me look at the word I and highlight it for you. And, when you go into the New Testament, Run straight to the New Testament. Now, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. Remember, I asked before, what is the eye? So he says, The lamb of the body is the eye. Okay, look very carefully. The lamb of the body. Remember, you need to get a body across, across the line. Is the I. But do you notice it used a singular word, I, not eyes? Because it's not referring to the physical eyes alone. Physical eyes are only a physical representation. The eyes are the spiritual desires. What you see will produce an image and make you want it. It is therefore important what you see. 
and there goes a whole series on visualization and yadza. But that's when I taught it, I taught it in a different way on the importance of it. But you don't realize that everyday images are flowing to you all the time. Images. Jesus said, "The lamp of the body is the." If therefore your eye is good, your whole body, again, do you see the word body? is full of light. If your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? He has actually given you the secret how to bring your body along. The eye. And if I were to ask what is the eye representing here, because you will say that the eye represents the spirit man, correct? In a sense, you're right. The life, the energy. But specifically, let me tell you tonight, the eye is the eye of desire. Whatever produces a desire. But we don't put the word desire produces the image that causes you to long and want the image. He has got you. All through the eyes. Then he goes, no one can serve two masters. You can only serve one. You cannot obey two. Only one can be your master. Or you will hate the other one and love the other. Then talk about the hate. Remember the problem of hate in Romans 7? I do what I hate. It's because the image, the problem is the image that the body has of the wrong thing. It wants the wrong thing. It has seen the wrong thing. There's a desire in the body for the wrong thing. The only way is to change the body's desire. So, we have 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. All these verses tell you the importance of the eye. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And I thought this was before. I have said that the word beholding as in a mirror is actually one Greek word. It's a Greek word katoktrizo. Katoktrizo is a word that originally means mirror. So in a sense, they're using it as a word. The, the exact Greek translation, without breaking it down too much, is but we all with unveiled face, mirroring the glory of the Lord, are transformed. Mirroring is the word. I'm still debating whether I should put the word mirroring rather than beholding as a mirror. Because the word beholding is not in the Greek. Only the word mirror, and the word mirror is used as a verb, a noun used as a verb. We, we seldom use the word mirroring, even in our English. But it's a, a noun used as a verb. Mirroring is to allow the image to enter into us. We are the mirror. Mirroring the image, we are changed. The whole secret is to get the image. If the image is correct, desire will grow. Desire will grow. Let's look at another case here. First Corinthians chapter. Two. 
Paul mentions a promise that God has. Now, isn't it interesting that God says this? I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. What does it mean? I has not seen, not yet heard. Why does it start with the I? Because when God wants to place something into your heart, it must come to the I again and the E again. Most important, the I again. It's through the eyes that it enters into your heart. That which God has. So we have here how to increase the desire from one drop. That desire must be so strong that it produces an image. If you can see that, you will want the image more than anything. Let me give an example of Paul. Right? Paul mentioned um, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18, correct? Look at how Paul functioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. One chapter after he mentioned that. Verse 18 is actually the last verse of the previous one. See, chapter 3 verse 18 is the last verse. In those days, they don't have chapter and verse. So he continue with his argument. Because chapter 4 verse 1 of 2 Corinthians says, Therefore, Therefore, since we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. And look at all those things that they go through. It says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. See, not our own self, but from God. The energy comes from God. Look at what he goes through. We are hard pressed on every side. Most people die of it. He said, Yet not crash. We are perplexed. Perplexed is another word like confusion, north, uh, north, south, east, west. But we are not in despair. Persecuted, left, right, center. But we cannot be destroyed. At the end of the day, he says, we are delivered to death for Jesus' sake. And in the end, he says, he is able to overcome this because in verse 16, we do not lose, which is equal to do not lose heart. Do you know if you lose heart, then you lose. If you always want to be a winner and not a loser, guide your heart. If your heart doesn't lose, you won't lose. You just get up again and go on. Get up again and go on until you win. Champions are made from many trials. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is re being renewed, our, and it calls everything outside, our light affliction. Is for a moment. Because in verse 18, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, and they are clearer than the things which are seen. See his secret? He saw. Whatever you see will always produce a desire in your heart. Remember that. Remember that. Desire is linked directly to the eye gate. So meditate is a process. Prayer and fasting is a process. But you must know what the process is for. The process is so that you can see whatever the desire God has put into you clearly. 
the more you see it, the more you want it. The more you want it, the more you want to see it. The more you see it, the more you want it. Under every drop of your blood is only for that. got a big secret tonight. How to harness all the energy of your desire. Watch what you see. If you turn your eyes to begin to look, here's, isn't it true that when you go out to buy for something and you, you just stick to it, you go up and grab a loaf of bread, came back. But you hang around. <laughs> you might say, hey, I need this. I need this. I need this. Because your eyes will create desire. And the more you look, the more likely you will buy. Why do you think the advertisers keep showing you things? 10 milliseconds, good enough. <laughs> And you don't even know you're being hypnotized. <laughs> now you know. You become unhypnotizable. <laughs> because you know. And I repeat, every single desire you ever had crept in by an image. Now, let me mention this. Why do some people sometimes have the desire desire to be a pilot because they might have met a pilot, heard about a pilot or seen a pilot from small oh the pilot advertisement 10 milliseconds <laughs> I want you to know we have discovered a great power and root of things Which means that if in your life you've got different type of desire, it takes time to break down the image that was locked on your inside. The more you see, the more you want. Even on the internet, you're scrolling. And you say, hey, I think I'd like to look at this type of dress or this type of thing. Keep looking, looking, looking. You watch and see. One hour looking, show buy something. And the more you look, the more you buy. Of course, subject to your budget. Yeah. So does this include the imagination? Yes, it does. And the visualizing. It does include all those categories. The image on your inside. Very, very important. And you know why a lot of Christians don't have desires for God? Because they don't see the image. They don't see what they can be. <clears throat> Which is why God sometimes gives visions and dreams to help you along. But when you have visions and dreams, you know what you should do about it? Keep on seeing it. When you fast and pray, you know what you must do? When you fast and pray, your mind is still blank. You must bring the image whether to writing or whatever. When you meditate, you must pause to allow the image to sink in. Because all those are processes to create an image on your inside. And that image, will in, the clearer the image, and here's the thing, the eye is the light of the body. You cannot serve two masters. In other words, if there are two images, the stronger one will win. If you serve Mammon, Mammon will win. If you serve God, put Mammon second. You can have many little desires, but there will be a prime desire, which is the main image of what you want. What's my driving image? I want to be the man who walks closest to God. That has been my goal from the day I came to know the Lord. 
is to drive me on. You need to see what you want. And now God give clear image of what it means, what it can do for you. And I can see clearly the image, the glorious church. Every member of the church don't have a single wrinkle. Wow. You want to belong to the church. That's the glorious church. Because the power of God is so great, it removes a blemish. Power of God goes to you. But you must see. You must see the possibilities. God gives so many visions, but people don't hold on to them. They don't keep looking through them. And the more you look, and it will, it will affect you. How many of you cry and sob and weep when you watch Korean drama? <laughs> If it's not a true story, of course sometimes it may be based on a true story, but most of the time, it is a story. After the actor finish acting, the actor write all the tears and go eat and food and laugh and drink. And you are sobbing. Ah, ah, ah. Because the images that keep flickering across the screen produce a story and the story move and touch you. Conquers your emotion. How about conquering the mind? Remember, you must get your emotion first. Your mind needs knowledge. And that's where... Do you know there are two ways that we do God's will? As a servant or as a friend? This is your type of relationship with God. And Jesus gave her the answer when he says in John chapter uh, 14. 15, John chapter 15. John 15. Jesus makes this statement. Verse 15. At the end of three years, he told his disciples, No longer do I call you servants. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. Notice the word know. But I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I made known to you. That is the difference. When they say that Abraham was a friend of God in James chapter 2, or in the book of Numbers, when Moses, uh, when, when, Aaron and Miriam were quarreling about Moses and God defended Moses and said, Moses is more than a prophet. In other words, trying to say he's my friend. Because in previous verses in Exodus, they say God spoke to him face to face like a friend. So God had two friends. What was the difference between friendship with God and service with God? When you're serving God, God doesn't tell you everything. But the day comes you have reached a second level of doing God's will. God talks to you. He lets you know. We do not jump to become friends of God. You must first serve. You learn to serve because He is your master. Then when we have become good servants, faithful servants, over a period of time, God starts sharing His secrets with us. When we become His friends, God tells us things and explains things to us. Many people, when they have vision, downloads, or whatever, the first thing they, they want God to explain. If you haven't mastered the art of being a servant, don't try to master the art of being God's friend. You must be a very faithful servant. And the Bible they say Moses was a very faithful servant. He's a faithful servant to God. He did God's bird beating. 
Abraham, he was he was literally a servant. Remember, he saw uh, God representing by the angels and the, the three of them together, the three men. And he ran. He didn't just walk. He ran to prepare things to serve. He was called a friend. But he was a, he he passed the servant stage. He was a category 10 servant. Then he became a friend. Most people are category 1 servant, with 10 being the best. Your category 1 servant want to ask a thousand questions. God says, just obey. Because he gives you the other words. Obedience is better than sacrifice. You know what King Saul was like? He was still trying to be category 1 servant. He hasn't even learned to obey properly. Then you're category 2, category 3, category 4, category 5, category 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You're close to friendship with God. God knows the moment I know something is what He wants to do, I don't have to understand. He has my absolute obedience. That's the way my relationship is with God. In everything, I will always say, is this what God wants? Is this what His voice is telling us to do? I will give myself hope for heart. When we went in February, which was still this year, February 9, 10, 11, to do the triangular thing. You think I understand everything? No. All I remember was, in 2012, at the end, 2012, this is 2015, right? 2013. Two years, when God was revealing about the birth of Antichrist this year, our angel Uriel says that, we should go on February the 9th, 2015 to Pergamos and pray for three places. After that, we go to three places. Moscow, he named it Moscow, Rome, and Tel Aviv. No explanation, nothing. Then, in 2000, wow, well, time has passed, passed. Uh, 2013, uh, and there's the hoo-ha, and then everybody forgot everything. I still remember. 2015, February the 9th, we must go. In the midst of the hoo-ha, everybody forgot, unremembered. Because we were told by the message of the angel, Go! And in my mind, I said, we will do it. Did we understand? No. But when we obey, it is done. And God doesn't have to speak to me directly. If He speaks to somebody else, then I bring to God. Say, God, is this your confirmation of things to be done? Like, this year, and when I go back in the next week, in fact, it's just the next weekend. This weekend and the next weekend, we are going to Snowy Mountain. God spoke to Clement in a vision, to Mark in a, a four-part or five-part dream. Two places would be altar. Did I question? No. The first thing I check is, is this God? Is this the voice of God? I don't care how it comes. And if I determine that this is God, as good as done, God. That's how God can entrust me, is it? When I know that it's of God, it's as good as done. Next year, we already confirm all the flights and everything for uh, what I call Wadi Ram, the, the highest mountain in Jordan. And we're going there next September. It's going to be wonderful. Out in the desert. Camp in the desert. All night prayer. Hallelujah. You know, come back with the dust all over you. So, obey, obey it. That is how friendship we got upon. Even though you're a friend, and Abraham became a friend of God, the moment God showed up, that's it, 100%. So, 
there are two categories of entering into God's will. Start as a servant and enter into friendship. When you're in a friendship level, remember what Jesus says? He will let you know what's going on. He will tell you things and explain things to you for your understanding. That's when the mind, the spiritual mind comes up. Spiritual mind. So to, tonight we touch on two different areas. The first area that we talk on is how the desire must come into us and it might win our whole body and win our emotions and every part of us. We found that the key is to the eyes. If the eyes can see it, and here's the thing, sometimes the desire is only a little bit. I'll give an example. Let's say it got called Eddie to go to Timbuktu. <laughs> oh, how is Timbuktu? <laughs> Do you know where is Timbuktu? Which country? Africa. Of course, it's Africa. You don't remember which country? Mali. Yeah, Mali. Mali. Yeah. So, he might just have a tinkling desire to go. Remember? Level 1, stage 1, cannot go yet. How to bring it, bring it up to stage 4? Last week I didn't give you the key, this week I give you the key. Now how? I'll give you a practical example. He must say, hmm, this Timbuktu thing is interesting. He must go to the internet, read everything care about Timbuktu. Study everything. Then look at pictures. Pictures, Timbuktu. If it is God, And then as you look, you might suddenly say, hey, this looks familiar. Ah, predestination. <laughs> and it might be that God might want him to go not just, uh, not permanently, of course, but for a visit. Or just like God spoke to you to go to Africa, remember? Uh, now you've got two places to go, right? Yeah. Sam. So, obedience. When, so when I know God wants to do something, I will start scheduling it. Fine, because unless we obey the rhema, nothing else comes. Whatever was depending on the rhema obedience, nothing else comes. But I've discovered something wonderful about God. When it is in your heart to do something and you really, really, really want to do it and are planning to do it and you're scheduled to do it and it's all locked in to do it even though you haven't done it, he consider it done. He start treating as if you already done it. That's the mercy of God. Because he, he knows how obedient we can be. It is important to do it. Put it this way, if God tells me to do something, I don't look whether I've got extra finances. I look where to find the finances to put it together. Different thing. Some people go ask them to do something, say, wait la, Lord, wait la, wait take a bit more, a bit more, they will never reach it. God is a God of faith. Why do you think when Abraham was to move, Abraham had a long conversation with God? And say, God, I'll go, you produce, and help me with ten trucks, camel loads of things, right? I need to accumulate some more. You know, Canaan, what, what is that? Don't know what is that. I need, I, I need to earn a bit more here. He would never even die and another person might have gone in. Right? There would be plan B. When God asks you to do something, you must be like a young man. If God had asked to sell everything you have, give to the poor and follow you to his trip. Don't be like the young man. You cannot love. Oh, sell everything. Oh. Then tomorrow what to eat? Depend on Jesus. If Jesus got food, you got food. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. You think Jesus will eat duck? <laughs> no need to eat. Okay. So Jesus don't eat. Don't eat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Follow Jesus. Jesus got no place. Got no place. You didn't just say, come, follow me. So, he missed his big chance. Remember we said, seek ye the kingdom of God. All the things will be added to you. And by the way, have you got my answer yet? Does Jesus eat duck? The one you should get your answer straight away. He eats up. Anybody thinks Jesus eat duck? Raise your hands. <laughs> Not sure. Okay, here's the thing. Does duck have wet feet? <laughs> ah, thank you very much. Animal that have wet feet. Ah, picking duck is gone. But your Gentiles still there for you. So, the key. <laughs> the key is a bird, it's okay. So, vulture definitely cannot. I know, but you got wet feet. Wet feet. You say birds with wet feet. Certain birds cannot. Jesus will not eat vulture. Even if it cooks sweet and sour. So, <laughs> so, tonight's food sermon <laughs> is this fact that we need to be able to grow the desire through bringing the vision until it's so real. If we will hold it long enough, a desire will come. A desire will come. And then this desire will produce. Yes? <laughs> She's asking for another one and a half hours. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we still got one more week, remember? Yeah. Today we cover on the fact, because it's part of the process. See, when your eyes are seeing only the things that come from God, all the other desires disappear. Yes, Abigail. How do you ensure that you only see the right things? <laughs> <laughs> it's like if I see chicken rice, then I want chicken rice. But if I see the peace of God, then I want the peace of God. Ah. Uh, okay. Is that when the chicken rice is there? You put something between you and the chicken. That <laughs> <laughs> rice. <laughs> okay. Put something between you and the chicken rice. And the key is to always see in the spirit everything, even if there's something in the natural that is there. So you need to see. Now, when Jesus saw a woman, making bread. Did Jesus see the woman and the woman making bread? Or did Jesus see a new parable? Leaven. The woman making leaven. When Jesus saw businessmen selling pearls, did Jesus just see the pearl or can he see the meaning behind the pearl? Everything in this life is representing something. So when you can see the spiritual element above those things, then you realize. Like, remember, when you look at the chicken rice, remember, all food, like Eddie was saying, passion for food. Wow, so much passion for food. You need to fast two extra days. <laughs> so, because... Uh, when, whenever you see those things, you need to see the other element. 
to me, all food that we eat is only for your clothing. What? Your body is just your tent. Your body is just your clothing. Are you wearing two layers? Eh? Eh? Yeah. Yes. Can I borrow the outer layer? This one. Ah, for illustration. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, no, that's your scarf, right? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, this one? Ah. Uh, I, I mean, from her easier jacket. Huh? From the corner. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. It might be cold for a while, but should be alright. Okay. This is clothing, right? Hey, by the way, I did the clothing fit on Sunday night. I tried it. <laughs> so, your body is just a clothing. You cannot take the clothing to heaven. The clothing has to change to something spiritual. Your body is only the clothing, it's not the real you. The real you is your spirit and your soul, which doesn't look like your body. Something like your body, but more glorious. If you always remember that your body is just the clothing, and everything you do is just for the clothing, and that's not the real you, you won't fast so much. You won't be so fussy. I mean, you will still look for the best. But for me, because most of the... I, I have so few days for eating that when I eat, I make sure it's a really good meal. <laughs> but, I'm not fussy. If there's nothing much but that, I'll just take what is there. Alright, so, thank you very much. Your body is just clothing. So the next time you look at chicken rice, remember that chicken rice is just helping to iron your clothes. <laughs> so, so chicken rice is like, okay. So you need to remember that, that all that you're doing in the natural is just for your clothing. You need to have sufficient time for your real you. Think how much you do. So when you exercise, you're just ironing your clothing. Some of your clothing need ironing. <laughs> so you need to keep yourself fit to iron your clothing. So you got to see differently. Remember, the eye sees everything. But yet the eye don't see everything. The eye need to see the real thing. Jesus, whatever he does, could see the spiritual behind it. When you look at the farmer sowing, you can see that that is the word being sown. Where did Jesus get his parables from? Every parable came from natural life, correct? Jesus was observing natural life. He was not like segregated as a hermit in a, in a cave. He looked at natural life. And you could see that, okay, the sowing is like the word. All his parables came from normal life. When he said, come, I will make you fishers of men. You see people fishing. And you could see that, that it's like catching humans. Bringing them into the kingdom of God. So it's important to see the natural and the next time your Chinese New Year come, February the 9th, February the 7th, mm -hmm. which is your 40th day of fast if you start on the 29th, which is your 38th day of fast if you start on the 1st. When you look at the pig, <laughs> and the roast pig in front of you, remember, he sacrificed his life for you. <laughs> 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 okay. That sacrifice is life so that you could have you could have something to eat. So think about everything you got to think a higher dimension. And of course the most important is the real images of God. Like what do I see? 
every day when I pray, I see signs and wonders. I see miracles. I keep seeing it before my eyes. I see Shalom walking. Amen. I see myself taking Shalom all over the world. I see Amen. Shalom, some of the visions, I add to my seeing. I see Shalom walking, you know, teaching. I, I see uh, uh, the stick turned into snake. I see us being transported. I see, and I keep seeing, and I keep seeing. Remember what Paul said, we do not look at the things of this world. So if he didn't want, was he looking at? He keep looking at the spiritual dimension. He keeps seeing the things that God revealed. Why do we, why do I have a burning desire for heaven? I keep seeing it happen. Whatever your eyes lay on, your eyes will desire. If you can keep seeing heaven and Jesus, you will love heaven. You will love to be there. You will love to. Some of you say, I didn't see any vision or that. It doesn't matter. You develop from your desire. Because just as the eyes produce desire, desire will produce the eyes. The desire will bring you into the pictures of what your eyes see. Isn't Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17, 18 says, The Spirit, wisdom, and revelation will open the eyes of your understanding. The eyes are there. So next week, we will tell you about how to feel that. <laughs> but then I added the other point, I summarized the point. First, the eyes, to increase the desire from level 1 to level 4. So today we tied with last week. But I added, don't think about your inside, just you. Think about becoming a friend of God. You want to be someone who God can say, on the planet Earth now, I have that friend. For the privilege of friendship, you must pass the servanthood test of category 1 to 10. You must learn to hear God obey, hear God obey, hear God obey. Sometimes He will test you whether you will obey. Hear God obey, hear God obey, hear God obey. Always choose. And then when you pass a certain test, God says, I am well pleased with you. You're my friend. Then, another level of revelation. God has a different relationship with you. Remember, He says, I don't call you servants now. You are now my friend. He told His disciples. For He says, a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I will now let you know what I am doing. They reach another category. So when you obey God, aim for that. You know, it's all right even if on this earth you don't have many friends. Just make sure that the few friends you have among them is God. And the world will become more evil, so they got less and less chance of friends with the world. But the most important friend of all your friends is God. So then you can ask you, who is your best friend? Some of you might talk about your spouse and all that. Understandable. But in a sense, who is your best friend? Should be God or Jesus. If Jesus is not your best friend yet, let me tell you, you don't know God yet. If Jesus is not your best friend yet, let me tell you, you're less than Abraham. Correct? I thought Abraham was a friend of God. If Jesus is not your best friend yet, you're less than Moses. And your New Testament is a disgrace. If Jesus and God is not your best friend yet, Something is wrong with your Christianity. If you are a disciple of Jesus, if Jesus is not your best friend yet, you're not even reached in John 15. You're like the disciples before Jesus went to the cross. 
shame on us. Of all the people in the world, you are the bride of Christ. You know who the bride of Christ is? Remember, we always tell about people the best marriage is a marriage of best friends. So, in terms of a created being an early person, your spouse is supposed to be your best friend. Why do you think Jesus wants us to be his bride? If on earth we say the best marriages are the marriages of friends, the best friend, they can last through any storm. And Jesus chose us to be his bride. Shouldn't the bride know Jesus better than any being in the universe? The angels don't get married to him. We do. We should know Jesus better than the angels. And Jesus should know us, of course, better than anything. We should know Jesus better than the four living creatures. The four living creatures are not getting married to him. We are. We should know Jesus better than the 24 elders because 24 elders are not getting married to him. We are. We thank God for the four living creatures, the 24 elders and all the angels. They are all helping impart their knowledge to us, bringing us to the place so that we can be the best friend to Jesus, His bride, we, His bridegroom. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your grace and Your mercy upon our lives. We ask so, Father, that we will catch a glimpse of what it is to do Your will. Because for us doing Your will, we just start with a servant. But I have given to your people, your bright father, the image, the idea, the inspiration, and the vision that you want us to be your friend. For when you created man before he fell, you were so eager that you walked in the garden with him. And that fellowship was broken. Man did not continue to walk with you. You always wanted to restore us back to the close walk that we were made to walk for you. We were made to love you. We were made to love you and walk with you closely. So we pray, Father, that for everyone who leave this place tonight, I pray that you put a desire in their hearts. And everyone who hear this word, to be a friend of God. Not just a friend. The closest friend God could ever have among His created beings. Of course, to be your friend, we need to get out all the mud out of our lives. We cannot soak ourselves in sin and unholiness because you are a holy God. But we desire to be your friend in the highest beauty of holiness. To live that direction we aspire to be. Thank you, Father. Seal this image to everyone. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good